together. So excited to study God's Word with you all tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer and just ask the Lord's blessing over our time in His Word this evening. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have. Lord, tomorrow, the 4th of July, declaring, Lord, our independence. And yet, we're here today, Father, also declaring our dependence upon you. Because this nation was founded on godly principles, Lord. And, and I pray, Father God, as we look ahead to tomorrow, that we would not lose sight or, Father, lose our thanksgiving for all that you have done for us as a nation. Father, the fact that we're here uh, without fear, studying your word where there are others around the world, Lord, who are huddling together, hoping to not get caught. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've blessed us with, and we pray that we as a nation would stay the course. Father, we pray that you would use us as a church to stay the course. Lord, there are times in life, Lord, we, we can't control what other people are going to do, but we know where we stand. We stand by faith. Father, we make a choice for you. We pray that you'd open up your word and give us helpful application, Lord, to live our lives in a manner that honors you, Lord, trusts you wholeheartedly, we pray in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We're going to look at all of chapter 12 and a part of uh, chapter 13 tonight. The title of my message is called Walking by Faith. Walking by Faith. We're going to look at just the first eight verses in chapter 12 and then begin our study. Here we are told in verse 1 of chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel. And pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, God had called Abraham to leave his country, to leave his relatives, to leave his father's house. I don't know if you've ever made a big major move in your life, but we need to realize our major moves in life are not like their major moves in life. You know, we can always take a flight or a train back or drive a car back. You know, we have cell phones. We have ways to stay connected through Twitter and Facebook. You know, there's so many conveniences that we have. When they leave or when they left, it was it. They may never see their family, their homeland again the rest of their lives. And Abraham was called of God to do just that, to leave everything behind. And God promised to give Abraham land, descendants, and his blessing. Three things that we're told here in verses 1 through 3 that God promised to give Abraham. Now, back in chapter 11, we're told that Abraham actually didn't immediately go to the promised land. God got held up a little bit in Haran because he was from Ur of the Chaldeans. So he got held up in Haran because his father, Terah, went with him. And Terah didn't really want to go all the way. It was kind of a half-hearted start, so to speak. And so it was after Terah passed away that God called Abraham again. And this time he went forth by faith to the land that God would show him. Now when we come to this passage in Genesis chapter 12, we also need to realize something. When we think of Father Abraham, the friend of God, we think of someone who already has mature faith. Here he's 75 years of age and he's just a babe. He's immature. 
He's just taken the first few wobbly steps that babes take in their faith. But the other thing we need to keep in mind is this. God is patient with babes in their faith. He is, because he knows they're just babes. And what he wants to do is see them grow to maturity. And he is committed to their welfare, committed to strengthening them in their faith so that they will be mature in their faith and experience the fullness of God's blessing on their lives. Abraham's God is our God too. And he's committed to the very same things in your life and mine as well. Now, tonight we're going to discover some important principles, I believe, from this passage regarding walking by faith. If you're taking notes, the first thing I'd like to have you write down is this. Faith is wholehearted devotion to God. You know, if we're in this thing called Christianity, let's not be lukewarm. Amen? Let, let's not say, I want to kind of keep one foot in the world and one foot in Christianity and kind of toggle between the two when things are convenient to do so or when it's to my perceived advantage to do so. No, if I'm in this thing called Christianity, if I'm truly going to take God at his word, then it's all that I am. God has given me everything and he expects wholehearted devotion in return. He's wholehearted to us. We should be and must be wholehearted in our devotion to Him. We need to realize that, that faith is a personal choice. Notice here in verses 4 through 5 that Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. See, before he was half-hearted, it didn't work. How far did he get? He went to Haran and stopped right there. It was a dead end. God calls him again. This time he's made a decision. He's in it. It's a choice. He left Ur of the Chaldeans. Now he's leaving Haran, and God promised to bless him, and so now he's going to stand on those promises. He had to make a personal choice to believe. Brothers and sisters, he couldn't rely on his father, Terah, to do it. Terah, we're told in the book of Acts, was an idolater. He was distracting Abraham from moving forward with a wholehearted devotion towards the Lord. He couldn't rely on him. He couldn't rely on his wife. What did he have to do? It was between him and the Lord. When it comes to faith, we cannot ride on the coattails of someone else. This is my decision. This is my moment. This is my relationship with the Lord, and I can't share it with anybody else in that sense. It's my choice. It's my life, and I'm responsible for what I choose. And that's what we see here with Abraham. He gets up, and he goes. He's making this big move. Now, he goes to the land that the Lord had spoken to him. By the way, he had never been here before. He, he didn't have Google Maps, you know, uh, Google Earth, kind of get a lay of the land before he gets there. He had none of those things. He's totally trusting the Lord. Which way do you want me to go? God's saying, I want you to follow me, and I'll tell you when you get there. How many of us would like that kind of lead? We want to know everything in advance, don't we? Go, and I will tell you when you get there. But the beautiful thing is, brothers and sisters, he's 75 years old. It's never too late in this life to start living by faith. What a beautiful picture here. He left Haran, and he entered Canaan. He chose to leave his past and pursue God and all that God had for him. You know, it really reminds me of the Apostle Paul. Paul was one who said, you know what, whatever things according to the book of Philippians were gained to me, those things I count as rubbish. I count as loss compa compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. He also said it this way in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. Can you hear him worship as he's saying these things? I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. What is he saying? The one I used to persecute, the Christians that I used to persecute, now I realize this is the very one who came and died for me. And I'm identified with his death, burial, and his, his resurrection. His life is my life. His death is my death. And I am all in by faith. By faith. I have been crucified. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to take up my cross daily as a disciple 
and follow Jesus. That's what Paul's saying here. It's a personal decision. It's a decision that he made. It's a decision that we need to make as well. But we need to realize that faith is for public consumption. A lot of people think, and I know that doesn't sound very politically correct, people, when they think of faith, they just say, now you just keep that to yourself. I know that's good for you, but you know what? To each his own, so to speak. But that's not true here with Abraham. We're told in verse 6, he passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants or seed I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, Abraham is being very public about his faith. He comes to Shechem, to specifically the oak of Moreh. And you need to realize the oak of Moreh, Moreh means oracle or teacher. And it was a place of idolatry. It was a place for pagan worship. And the Canaanite, they were in the land and they're watching. Who is this guy? And it was there in this place of idolatry that the Lord God, the living God, the true God, appears to Abraham and says, this is it. You've gone all this way. And here's the land I'm giving to your descendants. This is it. And how did Abraham respond? He built an altar. In the midst of all that pagan idol worship, here he is being very public about his faith. The altar represents worship and devotion. Though devotion is held deep in the heart of a believer, it also expresses itself in worship and publicly if the occasion calls for it. You see, faith is visible. Faith is alive, it's active, and it must be unashamed. We must be proud. This is what God has revealed. Lord, we glorify and we glory in you. If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in what the Lord's done, you see. Abraham was at a traditional location, as I mentioned, for pagan worship, surrounded by all these pagans, all these Canaanites. And I'm sure they were wondering, who is this guy? Who is this God? Where's his idols? I love what Martin Luther had to say. Abraham is preaching to the Canaanites here. And he is. You know, you always knew where Abraham had been. Because if you look at verse 8, he then proceeded to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. As you go through the book of Genesis, what do you see with Abraham? God gives him a promise. God reveals something about his character. And what does Abraham do in response? He builds an altar. You always knew where Abraham had been because there was a place of devotion. There was a place of worship. There was a, a reminder of God's promises, a declaration of his faith expressing itself in worship. And I really believe that the Lord wants you and me to be the kind of people that has this kind of living faith. Uh, without a show of hands, what kind of impact is your faith having on the people around you? Honestly. Do people even know you're a Christian? Do they know where you stand? Or do you just keep it to yourself because you don't want to make waves? I believe the Lord wants us to leave this place a better place than what it was like when we first got here. Amen? He wants us to have seeds that are planted. He wants our lives to be salt that creates thirst. He wants our lives to be light that confronts darkness. When we leave, does an altar remain? Can people see the benefits because we had been there? Paul puts it this way in terms of this unashamed faith. Romans 1, 16 through 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. There it is. Do you have that unashamed faith, that boldness? 
If not, I believe the Lord wants to give you that liberating work of his spirit that you feel free to proclaim and to stand no matter where you're at and declare Jesus is the way. Jesus is the salvation. Jesus is the life. Amen? That's what he wants for everyone. Faith also expresses its devotion to God in another way. It sees the big picture. If you're taking notes, the second point is this. Faith sees the big picture. And this is so important for us to understand. What do I mean by seeing the big picture? Uh, notice something here that's mentioned in verses 8 and 9. As we mentioned earlier, he pitched his tent, verse 8, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Faith sees the big picture. What do I mean? It sees what God is trying to do overall. You know, oftentimes in our lives, we get so narrow focused, we can only see what's going on right now, right in front of us, Faith lifts up our chins, we look to the heavens and we see that there's a God on the throne who loves me, who has a plan for my life, and no matter what comes into my life, it's passed through his hands, he cares for me, he can sustain me, he can protect me, my life is his. I'm not going home until he's ready for me to go home. If he leaves me here, there's a reason why I'm here. And that's to have a life that speaks to his glory and points people to Jesus Christ. There it is. It sees the big picture. Faith also firmly stands on God's promises. You see, as I mentioned earlier, God had promised Abraham what? He promised him the land to make him a great nation and to give him a great name, right? Notice, by the way, in verse 7, the land was given to his descendants, though. I find that very interesting. I'm giving this land to you, but it's your descendants who are going to really inherit and occupy it. And so what do we see, Abraham, and in terms of his response? He just pitches a tent. That's significant. He's making a statement by pitching a tent there. All the days of his life in Canaan, by the way, Abraham lived in a tent. He never built a house. He never built a mansion, even though he was very wealthy. In fact, he never purchased property except to bury his dead. Now, what was he saying here? What does this tent tell us? What does it signify? It means this, that Abraham considered himself a pilgrim, a stranger in the land and not a citizen. It was a temporary place for him. Abraham was set apart from the current occupants of the land. And you know what? The same themes carry over into Christianity. We're living in tents too, but not for long. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I don't know about you, but, you know, when you see all the things that are going on in the world, it just makes me long for home all the more. Amen? And I'm not talking about Hillsboro. <laughs> I'm talking about heaven. This is just an earthly tent to accomplish God's purposes. What is also interesting, we're told in 1 Corinthians, you and I, this earthly tent is now filled with the Holy Spirit, so now you're called a temple of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing thing that the very one, the Holy Spirit of God, is now dwelling in us to empower us, to shape us, to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ, and to give us gifts so that we can use them for the edification of the body and the glorification of God. Amazing what God's doing in this earthly tent, but we're not home yet, is my point. We're citizens of a different land. Has anyone ever traveled overseas before? I have many, many times uh, been to some areas that have been very, very dangerous, especially in Africa. And you know what? There's something about seeing, like at a U.S. Embassy, the United States flag. It's like, oh, there's a taste of home there. And then when you actually arrive on American soil, you really just want to kiss the ground, you know, at the airport. It's like, I'm home, you know. How much more so our heavenly home? Our heavenly home. That we're citizens of a different land. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 3, 20 through 21. For our citizenship 
My passport says I'm a citizen of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. You know what? Someday, because God has the power to do it, he can take things down and he can bring things up without exerting any effort at all. Just the spoken word, and it's done. Look at what's going on in Egypt. Things can be taken down in a moment, right? And God doesn't have to exert any power. That same spoken word, that same power that he has, that power of the Holy Spirit, he's going to use to transform you and me. You know, the older I get, Advil's becoming a good friend of mine. You know, the joints kind of creak. You know, things, you know, even, even I got here early Sunday morning to help get all the chairs moved over and the table set up. The next day I'm going, man, I'm really feeling achy after moving things around. Why? Because this earthly tent, right, it's getting older. You look in the mirror and you wonder, what just happened to me? You know, the night before, it's crazy. What age begins to do? You begin to groan, right? But here's the deal. I hate camping. Really, in a true sense, I, I really don't like camping very much. But also, in a spiritual sense, really, I think we tend to war against that idea of, of, of living in this tent. What do I mean by that? We try to make earth our home. We, we really try to set up some permanency here, some permanent residency here. And yet, the body's telling us over and over again, this is not the place. This is not your home. There's another place that's much better. Paul continues when he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Man, that's the big picture right there. Faith stands on the promises of God. Well, what is the promise of God? Jesus promised that I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come back, that where I am, you may be with me also forever. In John chapter 14. That's a promise we need to stand on. That brothers and sisters, this is not all there is. That when I leave this life, I'm going to be in the very presence of the Lord. To, to live as Christ, Paul says, but to die as gain. Because I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord forevermore. In light of this big picture, in light of these promises, faith is also willing to wait for God's best. Don't put your hope here on earth. Put your hope in heaven where God is. It's willing to wait for God's best. You see, Abraham was content dwelling in a tent because he was waiting for a better city. Notice what is said in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, for he was looking for the city which has foundations. Look at this. Whose architect and builder is God. He, Abraham says, okay, I see the promise, but I'm waiting for something better. Thank you for the promise. My hope is for something better. I'm content dwelling in a tent because I know there's something better that awaits me. He was content even though he would never realize God's promise on this side of heaven. The writer of Hebrews continues. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's look at uh, verses 13 through 16 together. Hebrews 11. Notice what is said here. This is one of those passages that just blesses me and challenges me at the same time. All these died in faith without receiving the promises but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they had went out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham never saw it in this life, but he saw it by faith. And he says, you know what? My hope is where God is. My home is where God is. He's prepared a place for me. And what does God say to that kind of wholehearted devotion? I'm not ashamed to be called their God. 
man, does that challenge you or what? Oh, God, that you would look upon me and see such wholehearted devotion that I'm standing on your promises, that my life and my faith is public, I'm willing to declare where I stand, and that you would say of me, well done, my good and faithful servant, that you're not ashamed to be called my God because I was a man who stood on your promises and took your word to heart with all of my heart. That's Abraham. That's his kind of faith. He pitched also, we see here, his tent between Bethel and Ai. Now, Bethel means house of God. It's on the west. Ai means heap of ruins on the east. Figuratively speaking, I think we're like Abraham in this life. We're still between two worlds. You see, uh, we're, we're moving towards our heavenly dwelling place, the house of God, we're moving away from this heap of ruins called the world, right? And that's what we see here. He's in between these two worlds. But listen, as long as we stay devoted to the Lord and patiently endure while waiting for the promises of God, we will do well. Warren Worsby put it this way. Whenever Abraham abandoned his tent and altar, he got into trouble. Whenever Abraham abandoned his tent and altar, he got into trouble. Meaning, whenever he leaned towards Ai, the heap of ruins, he got in trouble. Our home is where God is. The next thing I want to point out is this, if you're taking notes. Faith will be tested. If you look at scriptures, there's a pattern. There's a promise that is given. And then there's a period of waiting. And that period of waiting, sometimes... In that period of waiting, there's even trials. There's opportunities either to stand or to concede. But faith will be tested. There's that waiting period where the promise is tested. And really what's being tested is, will you stand on the promises of God? Or will you try to accomplish it through your own power and strength? Will you stand on the promises of God when it looks like everything in the world is hopeless and everything has fallen apart? Or will you look to the one who is faithful, who promised, and say, you know what, because of his character, I'm going to stand on this promise and I'm going to wait patiently for the Lord. Faith will be tested. And if your faith hasn't been tested, it will be. Hate to be the bearer of bad news. It just is what it is. Send your complaints to Pastor Rich at rich at calvaryhillsboro.org. It just is what it is. Faith is going to be tested. And famines test our faith. Notice what is said here in verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, See now, I know that you're a beautiful woman, and it will come about when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you're my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. And it came about when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. She's 65 years old at this point. Therefore, he treated Abram well for her sake and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys, donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away but with his wife and all that belonged to him. Faith is going to be tested, and famines test our faith. Now, we go back to this passage here. God pr promised that this land would be for his descendants. But in the midst of the land, this famine occurs. Now, the question is, why would God allow a famine in Abram's life? And I believe we need to understand tests this way. They're designed to strengthen and not weaken. But the choice is ours. When you go through a test, you will either get stronger or weaker, but the choice is yours. God's heart is for you to become more mature. God's heart is for you to be strengthened, but the choice is yours. Here, God wants to strengthen Abraham's faith. 
that he would begin to see as he's being stretched that he can rely on God, that God's going to be reliable, that God's going to be faithful, that he doesn't have to come up with his own schemes and take measures into his own hands because God helps those who help themselves. Not a biblical passage or verse. He's teaching him a lesson here. By the way, now Abraham becomes an example for Israel's faith. God would use him to encourage his descendants later on. I find it interesting. Interesting parallel here. Israel had been held as slaves for 400 years in Egypt. Then they're set free by a series of plagues. Okay? The first thing they encountered after leaving Egypt was what? A shortage of water. A famine in the land. But what did they do? They grumbled. So what is God going to do? He's going to help try to bring them to maturity because they too were babes in their faith, taking those first wobbly steps of faith. And God does the same thing in us. He uses these famines to show that we can be stronger if we put our hope in the Lord. That's why James says in James chapter 1, uh, 2 through 4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have, it's a choice, it's perfect result. Why? That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see, God is bringing these trials. Why? Because he wants you to look different. He wants you to... Put away all those things that you trust in and trust wholeheartedly in him. If you lack wisdom, he'll give it to you generously without finding fault. If you need grace, he will give you grace. If you need protection, he will protect you. If you need provision, hey, if he can take care of the Israelites for all those years in the wilderness, he can take care of you and me. Their sandals didn't even wear out. Their clothes didn't even wear out. He gave them manna from heaven. If he can take care of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, he can take care of you and me. He wants you to abandon all those other options and say, my heart is here and here alone. In the testing, that's what's going to happen. But there's something really beautiful. You know, he's seeing that person come to maturity, seeing them grow up. And we're seeing the same thing in, a, in, a, in, in our family with our little girl, Melina. Uh, you know, she's eight months old already. It's hard to believe our little baby girl's eight months. And there's so much personality wrapped up in that little body with this spiked hair at the top. I mean, it's just amazing. You know, you know what she likes. You know what she doesn't like. She knows how to clap now already. She knows how to wave goodbye. She can, I don't think she's ever going to crawl. I think she just wants to walk. She likes to already walk around the ottoman. And there's something that really happens with inside of our hearts as parents. On the one hand, there's this, oh, she's growing up too fast kind of feeling. On the other hand, it's like, wow, look at what she's doing. This is amazing. And I think that's the father's heart. Hey, there's my kid. He's trusting me. She's trusting me. Look at how they're growing up. Look at how they're getting stronger. Look at how they're maturing. And it blesses his heart to see his kids trust him even in the middle of famines. I have a question for you tonight. How strong is your resolve to keep the faith? How hot does it have to get in the kitchen for you to tube the faith, so to speak. For you to say, uh-oh, this is not time for faith. This is time for action. And I'm going to take matters into my own hands. How much pressure, really? A gut check. How much before you buckle? How much before you grumble? How much before you look at option B, C, D, E, and F? And abandon A. You know, um, one of my favorite characters in the Bible is Daniel. I love Daniel. If you read Daniel chapter 1, you realize that he was stripped away from his family. Why? Because God had judged Israel. Why? Because they had turned away from the Lord. And in keeping with his promises, found in the book of Deuteronomy, he was going to exile them into a foreign land, the land of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. The king wanted to take some of the best. And he was from one of the royal families, one of the nobles. And so what happens? He's brought into the court. And we're told in Daniel chapter 1 that the king was going to feed them, the king was going to clothe them, the king was going to have them educated, he was going to give them new names. He wants them to basically give up all that they had as their identity from Israel and now take on this new identity as a Babylonian. But we're told in Daniel chapter 1 that Daniel resolved in his heart 
to not partake of the king's food, to not be identified with all of that. And the Lord blessed him. He resolved in his heart. He's a young man. He's away from his family. He's have every excuse just to give it up. But he resolves in his heart not to do that. And you know, you look at his life, and you see there was a pattern set. There was a, a, a choice made. And now, no matter what comes his way, he's serving king after king, kingdom after kingdom. God is using him because he is resolved in his heart, no matter what comes my way, no matter what the circumstances are out there, I know where I stand, I've made my decision, and I will not be moved. Well, it resulted in something that was a threat to his own life, because we're told in Daniel 6 that some of the other governors and leaders, the satraps, they became a little bit jealous of him. He was number three in the land during the king, uh, reign of King Darius. Number three in the land, and it was looking like that he was going to get elevated higher. So, because Dar Daniel was so faithful, we're told that they couldn't find a cause for accusation. Wouldn't it be great to have politicians like that today? I digress. Anyway, there was no cause for accusation against him whatsoever. So they knew, listen, the only way we're going to get an accusation against him is if we have him do something regarding his faith that contradicts the law of the land. So basically, they had King Darius sign an edict that would last for 30 days, saying that if anyone's caught worshiping someone other than Darius, they'll be put into the lion's den. Now, what did Daniel do? This is the young man who's now an old man who, as a young man, resolved in his heart to not defile himself with the king's food. What's going to happen when he goes through that famine? Notice what is said in Daniel 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had previously been doing. I love that. Whatever the consequences are, Lord, here's where I stand. And they used it against him. They caught him. But you know what? He's not closing the windows. He keeps the pattern. I'm resolving in my heart. If this is the end of my life, then I trust you, Lord. But I'm going to continue to worship you, and no edict of man is going to keep me from doing so. I'm going to worship the Lord. Throws up in the windows. He worships the Lord. And what does God do? He shuts the mouths of the lions. He honors him. And I love that about Daniel. I want to be more like Daniel. How about you? To resolve in your heart. If there's not that resolve there, I think the Lord would want to strengthen that. Because the reality is, for many of us, there's failure when it comes to faith. There can be that faltering of the faith. And we see this here with Abraham. What does he do? He goes down to Egypt. He takes matters into his own hands. And not only that, he says, hey, Sarah, you're beautiful. And I know you're beautiful. And I know these guys are going to want to take you as, your wife, as their wives, as your wife, uh, their wife. So here's what you need to do. You need to say you're my sister, which is kind of a half-truth because uh, he, she was his half-sister. So just go ahead and just tell everyone you're my sister. It'll go well with me. It'll be okay. But what was he doing? He was forgetting God. He was forgetting the promise of God. He was forgetting his marriage vow. He was putting into jeopardy the fact that God wanted to, through Sarah, bring this promise about. He was throwing that all away. He also forgot that Pharaoh could have any woman he wanted. Was it worth it? I don't think so. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes every night wondering how his wife was doing. Was it worth it? Put yourself in Sarah's shoes. What were you communicating to her? I put myself above you. My personal safety above yours. Yeah, sure, he was given animals, but you know what he was also given? <laughs> Hagar. I find it very interesting. Given slaves, right? Hagar was a setup for the next failure. It's very interesting. One compromise is a setup for the next, and we see that here. This is why Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. 
Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, fortunately, God intervened. Abraham had no concern about the promise of God, but God did, and God intervened. And so here's the question I have for us. What do we do when we fail the test? What do we do when faith falters? I think we do what Abraham do, did. We go back to Bethel. Notice here in verses 1 through 4 uh, in chapter 13. Now Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him and Lot with him. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and gold, and he went on his journey from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where he, his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Why do I say this? Listen, when we fail, and we will falter, it does happen. But God's committed to us in the wobbly times. But what do we do when we fail? We don't go to Ai, the heap of ruins, and stay there. We go back to Bethel. We go home. We go where the Lord is, that relationship with the Lord. And maybe tonight you're struggling. Maybe tonight that faith is diminished. I want you to know something, that God is doing something so grand in magnitude and scope that it's beyond our ability to comprehend it. He's doing something for you, he's doing something in you, and he's doing something through you. And even though we may falter in our faith, it will not thwart God's plans. There's a story of these two missionaries, David and Sphia Flood. In 1921, they went to the Congo. They left Scandinavia, and they met up with two other Scandinavian missionaries, the Ericsons. And during that time, even though they, they were in the main camp there as missionaries, they really felt led of the Lord to go out into the field, to go away and to reach out the, to these peoples. It was a huge step of faith for them. And at the, the village of Endolora, uh, they were rebuffed by the chief. You see, the, the chief there of the, the village basically was concerned about these missionaries coming in and making their gods angry with them. So here they had this burden. They felt led of the Lord to reach out to this lost tribe of people. And what happens when they're there? They're pushed away. So what did they do? Well, they, they went up, a, up this slope about a half mile away and they built these mud huts. And they lived there. Uh, David and Sophia had a little two-year-old boy at the time. And they just prayed and they prayed and they prayed for a spiritual breakthrough. But it looked like nothing was happening at all. Um, in fact, the only contact they had with the villagers was this little boy that would come out and sell them chicken and eggs two times a week. But Sophia Flood, she was only about four foot eight, just this tiny little thing of faith. She purposed in her heart, hey, if this is the only one I'm going to have contact with, I'm going to lead this one to faith in Jesus Christ. And she did. She led this little one to faith in Jesus Christ. But there were no other encouragements. Well, if you know anything about Africa, you know that there's malaria there. And it had an impact. It took a toll on the, the two couples. And finally, the Ericsons had had enough, and they went back to the main camp. They couldn't take it anymore. Their health was suffering so bad. In the middle of it all, Sophia, there in the bush, she gets pregnant. And uh, it was a rough pregnancy because she had suffered uh, from malaria so much. The uh, village chief decided it when she was getting ready to deliver the baby to let a midwife come and help her out. And a little girl was born, and they named her uh, Ina. But Sophia only lasted 17 days after the birth of Ina. Something happened in David with the death of his wife. Something snapped in him. He buried his wife, hired a villager to go down the hill, and basically he goes to the Ericsons and he says, I'm going back home. Here's this baby. God's against me. My life is ruined. And he abandoned his calling and he abandoned his faith. He was done. Leaving his little newborn behind, he and his son went back home. And he left it all behind. Not much longer, the Ericsons died. And here this little baby was left with some American missionaries. And they named her Aggie. 
Now, the missionaries were concerned about there being technicalities in regards to having this child because they love this child so much. They decided to go back to America, and they stayed in America as pastors in the pastoral ministry. They raised the girl up in South Dakota. She went to a Bible college in Minneapolis and eventually married her husband, uh, Dewey Hurst. She met him there and married him there. Now, years passed, and they actually moved up to Seattle, Washington, and Dewey became the president, I believe, of Seattle Pacific University back in the day. And if you know anything about Seattle, there's a real strong Scandinavian co uh, culture up there, and she was intrigued by that. Suddenly, one day, she gets this religious magazine in her mailbox. Doesn't know who it came from. She opens it up, she begins to go through it, and all of a sudden, she comes to this one page that stops her cold. There was a picture of a primitive grave with the name Sphia Flood on it. She immediately goes to the university to find a college professor that can translate the rest of the article. The professor tells her it's about some missionaries who had come to Andolora long ago. They had the birth of this white baby, the death of the young monk mother, the one little African boy who had been led to Christ, and how, after the whites had all left, the boy had grown up and finally persuaded the chief to let him build a school in the village. The article said that gradually he won all the students to Christ. Even the chief had become a Christian. Today there were 600 Christian believers in that village. Now the story is good enough just stopping right there. But it gets better. The Hursts, for their 25th wedding anniversary, were sent by the college back to Scandinavia, back to their homeland. There Svea looked for her dad. David, her dad, was remarried, had four more children, and was an alcoholic. She had a wonderful reunion. While there, she discovered her father had had a stroke. His health was ailing. But this man had one rule in his house and one rule only. He said, never mention the name of God because God took everything away from me. After an emotional reunion with her half-brothers and half-sisters, she says, I want to go see Dad. And they said, well, you can see him, but just don't mention God, because if it's the name of God, he will break into a rage. But she wanted to see him nevertheless. She goes to his place, this little apartment, liquor bottles all over the place, and he's lying on this bed, face against the wall. She opens the door, and she says, Papa. He immediately turns around and says, Ina, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to give you away. And she goes, it's okay, Dad. God took care of me. And he goes, don't mention God. He's the reason for why we're what we are today. And she said, Dad, I want to tell you a story. Taking him into her arms, she said, you need to understand a true story. And she began to tell him how it had not been in vain when they went to Africa. That that little boy came to faith in Jesus Christ, and he was the one who led 600 Africans to faith in Christ. And now the whole village had been converted, and he goes on to tell, she goes on to tell him how Jesus loves him, that Jesus never gave up on him, that he wasn't angry with him. And David's heart softened, and that day he came home, back to the Lord. They had a couple of more days together, and I know I'm going long, please forgive me. Had a couple more days together, she goes back to America with her husband, and her father passes away into eternity with the God he had rejected but now had come home. It'd be good if the story stopped there, but it gets better still. Many years later, the Hearst are attending this high-level evangelism conference in London, England, and there was a speaker from Zaire, the Belgian Congo, where her parents had been. Afterwards, she really felt compelled, I need to go talk to the speaker. And she goes up to the speaker and she says, do you know David and Sphia Flood? And the man says, through a translator, I'm the boy that used to sell them the eggs and chickens. I'm the one who was led by your mom to faith. You must come to Africa because your mother is highly honored there. Many years later, she went to Africa 
met the pastor of the church there. And I want to read in closing what was said. The most dramatic event happened, of course, was when the pastor escorted Aggie to her mother's white cross for herself. She knelt in the soil to pray and give thanks. Later that day in the church, the pastor read from John 14, 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. He then followed with Psalm 126, verse 5, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're doing something great and you're calling us to trust you with that. I'm praying, Father, for us. Father, maybe there's some here tonight and they just feel like their faith needs to be fanned into a flame again. And I'm praying, Father God, that you would ignite that flame, that we would stand, that we would be resolved in our hearts to stand firm for you. If you're here tonight and you're saying, Matt, you know what, would you just pray with me? I want my faith to be ignited again. I want to be on fire. No matter how hard the trials hit, I'm going to stand firm. I resolve. I put my hope in the Lord. Would you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray with you tonight. Anybody? Yes, Father God. You see the hands that are raised, and I, I raise mine. Father, please, Lord, ignite that faith, that resolve to stand on your promises, to see the big picture. Father, to put our hope wholeheartedly in you. Father, we thank you that this life is not in vain and those who put their hope in you will never be put to shame. Continue to minister to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.